Welcome everybody to another exciting Xscale podcast slash webinar. Today, Peter Merrill and me, your host Stefan Wolpers, will be talking about uh, the bonus slash prisoner dilemma. We'll be talking about the tragedy of the PMO. We dip into the evolution of trust and probably have some time to have a look at open book management. Peter, how are you? I am very well, Stefan. I've been very excited about this one. Sorry to everybody who was looking for it two weeks ago. Unfortunately, things happen. But, um, but this should be a really, really good one. I'm excited about it. Have you, have you read the post of Marty Kagan last week uh, when he was lashing no. out on the PMO? You know, no. uh, he, was, he was talking about the, um, the comeback of the PMO, so to speak, this time in the disguise of supporting SAFE as a, as a scaling framework. It was really, mm -hmm. really funny. So um, I can highly recommend that. Marty Kagan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, look, I've, I've read a couple of, uh, uh, Leon Tranter wrote a, a nice article, uh, critical of uh, Agile PMO2 this last week or week before, if I recall correctly. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a right? I mean, how, how can this be Agile PMO? I mean, it's just <laughs> ridiculous. Isn't it? I, well, I think in the remedy of the PMO, we, we have a way to, to do it, but it, it's where we have to get into chapters and councils and treaties so that we're talking about self-directing and self-managing. I would agree at that level. Uh, I, I strongly believe in uh, you have job security, but no role security. But mm -hmm. in the case of the PMO, I would sacrifice the whole thingy just for the purpose of it to set a signal. You know, it's this Cortez mm -hmm. moment of burning your ships, you know. So it's all yeah. prevailing here or we're not going to go back. But the PMO is afflicted with a, a couple of game theoretic problems. Uh, 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 the, the, the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons. Uh, and we'll look at those illustrated here. Um, what, we, what we found is in approaching people who are involved in PMO with the X-scale stuff, uh, at first, uh, they, they don't want to admit they have a problem. So we, we play some very simplified games that, that, that sort of provide you with the, the game dynamics of a PMO. And once they've played a round or two of this, the penny drops and suddenly they realize, look, it's not the PMO itself is bad. It's that if we set it up in the way it's usually set up, we get stuff that really generates technical debt and legacy and politics and we need to approach it differently so we're going to start talking about that in this podcast i think the podcast after we'll probably get into uh some of the the stuff we do around chapters and councils and treaties and some of the iroquois stuff and that'll give us a way to approach the remedy in more depth but we will look at um, some of the reward model aspects of a remedy in this Make sense? Absolutely. Let's start. I'm curious. Okay, cool. There was a gentleman named John Nash. Uh, there was a movie about him called A, a Beautiful Mind. And Nash uh, is really the father of game theory. Uh, one of the games that, um, well, the, the game that most people know him for is a thing called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And this is a, a, a version of The Prisoner's Dilemma done as um, a bonus uh, uh, mechanism. So uh, we have two players. Each one has a minty. A minty is an Australian boiled lolly. We, we like using them as props because they convey the idea of value uh, in a more visceral way than um, uh, a ball or a penny uh, because you can eat them. Um, so we have two players. Each of them has a minty. They hold them behind their back. They bring out a, a hand and they open the hand and either, well, if both of them have a minty in their hand, then each of them gets an extra minty. They, they get a, a bonus minty for collaborating. If neither one of them has a minty in their hand, in other words, they're not collaborating, well, then neither one is, so neither one wins. Um, not collaborating, whether the word cheat is too strong or not, uh, I, I'm not going to make a, a value judgment about that at the moment, um, but we'll come to it. Uh, so if one of them collaborates with the other, but the other doesn't collaborate, then the one who doesn't collaborate gets two bonus minties and the minty from, from the one who did collaborate. So they get a, a plus three altogether. So there's an incentive for cheating. But at the same time, if both cheat, then 
then uh, then no one gets anything. So if we had uh, two pairs playing this and uh, one pair cheated all the time and the other one collaborated all the time, you would think the ones that collaborate all the time would do much better. So that's where this becomes interesting. Uh, if we have multiple players and we, we pair them up, and we've done this at um, conferences and, and uh, meetups, and it's very good fun. So um, we, we pair them up and uh, we get the pairs to have six turns each. And since it's possible to get a negative score, we allow those. We both start at um, a score of zero, and the, the maximum score you could get if you cheated the other person successfully uh, six times in a row would be, well, three times six is plus 18. And the minimum score is uh, if you got cheated six times in a row, if you allowed yourself to be cheated that many times in a row, then you would have a minus six. So what we do is after six of these turns, we we get a little uh, Kanban on a whiteboard or uh, uh, um, some butcher paper, whatever it is, a big post-it note. And we, um, we have people write their names on little post-it notes and stick them uh, next to the score from plus 18 down to minus six. And then the lowest scores, the 50% lowest scores, well, we, they all sit down and everybody else gets paired up again and they continue to play. So we do this three or four times, uh, and that's usually enough to get down to a, a single grand final for the last remaining uh, pair in the room. And it's always very interesting to watch the evolution of strategy during this. And there actually is an optimum strategy for this game, but I'm not going to go into it now because uh, I'm hoping people will discover it for themselves. So in the end, uh, we only have uh, one survivor there. And this is very similar to what happens in our management structures where we give people a bonus because their value stream got more business value than another value stream. And obviously, if, if two people, two managers collaborate or get their, their, their teams to collaborate, uh, then maybe that's going to do very well for them. But there's also an incentive to, to cheat. And often cheating means not paying down technical debt since technical debt affects everyone. Does that make sense so far, Stefan? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I want to flip over into this, this wonderful site, and I'm only going to walk through part of it. Um, uh, it was done by a gentleman named Nick Case. And um, uh, Case, uh, basically, he based this site, uh, I'm not going to read through the text, I want to show you how it works. He based this site on a book that was written in the 80s that was a book about uh, Nash equilibrium and game theory. So to begin with, we have uh, a, a player who's you, and they're wearing a red hat, and we have a player in a blue hat. And if, if you cheat and they cheat, uh, then neither gets anything. Uh, if um, you collaborate and they cheat, they get a plus three, you get a minus one. So you see this is the same game we were just looking at. And likewise, there's a plus two, plus two if no one cheats, no one doesn't collaborate. So let's say that um, uh, we're going to play this multiple times, just as we've described. And the hats indicate something about strategy. So let's begin by cooperating. We put a coin in, they put a coin in. Fantastic. We both got two now. So now let's try cheating them. Uh, we cheat them, and uh, then let's say we cooperate. Uh, they cheated us. And to whiz through the rest of this, the reason they cheated us is the, the blue hat strategy is uh, copycat. They basically do what we did the previous round. Uh, here's a different strategy. If I go cooperate, uh, they cheated us. Okay, well, let's try cheating them. Uh, they cheated again. We cheated. Let's try cooperating. They cheated us again. And in fact, that black hat, they always cheat. They are the, uh, they are the Donald Trump strategy. Uh, so, oh, I'm sure that's an unfair characterization. I apologize. Then we have another person who uh, is in a, a lovely pink hat. Um, no gender stereotypes here. I don't really know. Um, I'm going to try cheating them. Uh -huh, I was able to cheat them uh, or cooperate. They didn't cheat back. Oh, maybe I should keep cheating them. Maybe I'm a Donald Trump's Trump strategy. The person in the pink hat always cooperates no matter what. And then we've got this gentleman, or lady, who knows, in the yellow hat, like a cowboy hat. So I cooperated. I'll try cheating them. And now if they're in a cowboy hat, I think I might try cheating them back again. They cheated that time. Okay, so they're at the very least going to do that. I'll try cooperating this time. Oh, well, maybe I can make an impression on them by cooperating again, since we're even Stevens. Oh, they cheated me again. 
And that's not too surprising because the cowboy hat, they're, they're called a grudger. They, if, you cheat, if you ever cheat them, after that, they always cheat. If, uh, before you cheat them, they always cooperate. And then we've got this gentleman in the deerstalker hat like a Sherlock Holmes. So we'll start by cooperating. Let's try cheating him then. Oh, he cheated as well. He's clever. I'm going to cheat him again. Uh -huh. Okay. I'll try cooperating this time. He cooperated that time. He's got something strange, strange going on. I'll cooperate one more time. Okay. Well, let's keep cooperating. Why not? He's awfully smart. Uh, I'll cheat one more time. Let's see. The person in the Sherlock Holmes hat, they try to analyze behavior. Uh, so they uh, cooperate and they cheat, they cooperate twice. Then if you ever cheated them back, they act like copycat. Otherwise they act like always cheat. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about these, but what becomes interesting is when we try to get these strategies to play each other. Um, I'm going to guess that uh, if they do 10 rounds each and they play in pairs, that uh, the overall winner is going to be the detective. Let's see if I'm right. Uh, it's adding up the scores from one match to the next. And they get through all of those. The winner is actually copycat, even though you'd think Sherlock Holmes is awfully smart. But the second uh, lowest, so the second highest score is the grudger. But uh, really copycat's way in the lead. But where this gets interesting is where we start thinking about it in terms of the evolution of a culture. Does this make sense so far, Stefan? Oh, it is basically the uh, explanation why things can go so awfully wrong. Uh, often we think that the people who are involved in the organizations we work with are good or bad, they're nice or they're nasty or tricksy, but they go home at night, they, they pat their dog, they kiss their wife, they tuck their kids into bed, they have lovely neighbors to live next to. It's only when they are at work that they act as rat bastards, if you pardon my French. And it's because they understand something about what, the way the games work that we don't necessarily understand. In this one, what we're going to look at is a tournament uh, or a series of tournaments where we start out with a population of players with different strategies. The uh, lowest scoring, lowest scoring five will get eliminated and we'll re replace them with the highest scoring five. So that way we get to see how uh, a culture of trust or distrust evolves. So Stefan, who do you think is going to win of, um, uh, let's see, we've got uh, the pink hats and the copycats and the black hats. I put my money on the copycats. Copycat? Let's see. Okay, so we play a tournament. We eliminate the bottom five. Uh, reproduce the top five. I don't know. We've got black hats. Uh, ooh. Black hats are definitely in the lead. Play again. Eliminate the bottom five. Reproduce top five. It does not look... Oh, wait a second. We got more copycats then. I think you're right. I'm pretty certain you're right. Yeah, the black hat strategy, at least with this reward model, um, loses to the copycats. But there are more variables involved than you would think, and there are more strategies. Let's have a look at a, a tournament with uh, all of the the, oh, the copycats still come out. Oh, wait a second. The grudges are lasting for a while. I think they're going to lose in the end. And I'm not going to make us wait for it. There is a, a problem we haven't really thought about so far. If we... If we are playing 10 rounds per match, we know what's going to happen. That's what we, we just saw. And if you were curious still about how this um, rounds per match variable works, then by all means, uh, go and visit Nick Case's site. Just if you Google for evolution of trust, you, you can then take your time walking through it. Let's try 20 rounds per match and see what happens. Same thing. All right, so it looks like copycats are good for almost everything. I'll try three rounds per match. Ah, ah, if 
we if we have too few rounds, it looks like the black hats get an advantage. Uh, let's try uh, six rounds per match. Uh, six rounds. The copycats win. Their, their strategy is maybe kind of the, the classic strategy. You start off uh, cooperating, and then if you get um, cheated, then you cheat. Let's try five rounds per match. Oh, so this is very sensitive. It might not be a good thing that in safe, there's only five sprints per product increment. Nah, I'm, I'm sure it's not that general. Uh, but there are more variables than we've, uh, than we've considered so far. Because, well, we said with this reward model, what would happen if we reduced the reward for collaboration uh, just a little bit from plus twos to plus ones and still keep 10 rounds per match? Ew. So just slightly reducing the reward for collaboration gets the black hats to win. What if we ramp it up to, let's say, plus three there? Ooh. It might even be that with enough of a reward for collaboration, we get a culture of perfect trustworthiness, or at least very close to it. I'm not going to make us wait. Let's try at combining that with a, more of a reward for cheating. Ah, now it looks more like copycats. Ah, no. Oh, it's a good question. It might be a dynamic equilibrium. Let's increase the, the cheating rewards just a little bit and see whether that helps. So just a tiny change in the reward model can have profound effects on the political realities of an organization. And there's one more variable to consider. We often have to pass messages through intermediaries. If we work in a hierarchy, often to get a message from one person to another or uh, to arrange collaboration between one person and another, we have to go through a manager and sometimes more than one level of manager. So let's say we are copycats and we're very happy. We start out by cooperating, so the other person we go to cooperate again, but oops, the message we had to pass through a manager didn't get accurately to the other person. Well, now, since we're a copycat, we have to cooperate, and they cheated us because we cheated them last time. And now, since we're a copycat, we have to cheat because they cheated us last time, and we'll continue doing that forever. So this is where the cycle of politics emerges. Deals get done, and allegiances change. And we think that they are discrete events, that, that these are things that happen forever. But if we take a broader view and a longer view, then we see these sorts of cycles happening all the time. To explore that, let's look at some extra roles. So a copy kitten, uh, she will only cheat if we cheat her twice. The simpleton is just crazy. If you uh, cooperate, they do the same thing as their last movie, even if they make a mistake. And if you cheat back, they do the opposite thing as the last movie, even if they've got a mistake. And then we've got randoms. So, uh, I'm, who do you think is going to win here, Stefan? Ooh. I'll still go with the copycat. Okay. Well, uh, let's try. Uh-uh. There was a 5% chance of making errors, and 5% was enough for the simpletons to win over the copycats, which is scary. But it gets scarier because, of course, there are black hats in the world. And with this mix, and again, 5% chance of making a mistake, who do you think will win? Hmm. I think I'll cheat. Let's see. No, it's the copy kittens now because they are the, the what happens is that the the black hats eliminate the simpletons and then the copycats and copy kittens eliminate the um, black hats. Uh, they always cheats. And then the copy kittens are more tolerant of mistakes than the copycats. 
And so we wind up with the copy kittens. Since everybody's playing everyone in these games, the copy kittens wind up winning. Um, I'm not going to wait for that either. What I think get really interesting is where we have changes in how likely it is that communication is not going to be accurate. If we had purely random, there's a 50% chance of making a, a mistake, then let's see, I'll start that. When it's purely random, it's actually impossible to predict. It really depends on which strategy gets knocked out first as to whether there's a dynamic equilibrium where it goes back and forth or whether uh, one or another tends to win. With randoms and black hats, I suspect it's just going to keep both of them forever. I'm not going to wait for that either. Let's try taking it down to one in four chance that we make, uh, that the players will make mistakes in their communications. So if I start that, black hats win almost immediately. Well, let's try 49% chance. So it's just a slight difference between 50 and 49. You wouldn't think that would make much difference. You would think that um, it would, again, turn into something unpredictable. But in fact, with just that one extra edge, the black hats win again, which is even more depressing. So let's take it down. We know what happens with 5%. Let's try uh, maybe... 10% uh, chance of a player making a mistake. So we know from 25 to 50, it's black hats. At 10, ooh, okay, still black hats. We know at five, it's copy kittens. Let's try 9%. Well, the copy cats fight back. <laughs> so this is astonishingly sensitive. If we add one extra layer of management or if we bring in someone who was if we replace someone who was a, a manager who was very consultative a servant leader with someone who is more command and control so that again we have less communication less accurate communication that's enough to change the the game theoretics of the entire culture to flip it over from a culture of collaboration uh, cooperation and trust to a culture of distrust uh, and of negativity. And anyone who's been through um, the growth of a startup to a big company knows there is such a tipping point uh, that suddenly, just from one day to the next, suddenly, uh, you know, we hired someone else or someone went on holiday and suddenly something has changed and a, a, a political culture or a backbiting or a distrust culture uh, comes in. And it, it isn't necessarily the fault of the new hire. It may be something about, well, any of these variables we just looked at. I'm not going to worry about the sandbox mode for this stuff, but the summary is that the more rapid our feedback cycles, the more experimental we are, the more trust is promoted. The, the more we reward win-win behavior, mutual benefit, collaboration, when there's actual financial reward or sometimes just social reward for that, the, the more we get a culture of trust. And miscommunication is terrible for trust, really terrible. Um, adding just an extra layer of hierarchy or um, a, a different style of management is enough to destroy the culture of trust. And the, 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 the biggest lesson of all is that the behaviors of the players depend on the rules of the game not on something inherent to their personality. Even if they do want to be a rat bastard, if they are in a game that rewards people who always cooperate, they will very rapidly switch their tactics so that they can get their, the, the rewards they're looking for. Oh, any questions so far, Stefan? No, no, it's, uh, it's a nice background for the old Charlie Munger quote that uh, show me the incentives and I will tell you the behavior. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so when, when we look at this idea of a culture of distrust, the real problem with it in business terms, because you might go, well, you know, all businesses are like this and yes, they grow and then they become bastards and they make lots of money. No. Um, accurate communication is only possible within a trust relationship. We need people to be able to talk to each other, to have an agile organization. If we are not able to share learnings accurately, then a competitor who is able to is going to 
stroll by us without even looking back. I fully that agree with you. The problem just is that yeah. it's uh, such a terribly slow process. You can add so much latency uh, built into this. Um, I'm being overtaken by a competitor because the, those yes. guys are learning faster than, than, than my organization is. Yes. Only realized is once it's too late. Yes. This is an illustration from the Dr. Zeus book, The Lorax. Um, and if you don't understand the connection, let me explain that it's a dramatization of a game that an environmentalist named Gareth Harden invented in the 1960s or discovered. Uh, Harden uh, reviewed the progress of, of medieval European villages, all of which had um, a commons, a, a, a field in the middle of the village that everybody shared and anyone was allowed to grow anything they liked in the commons. But Harden observed that whoever had the most successful organism there, Let's say that um, one person is growing strawberries and one person is growing uh, wheat and another person has a goat and another person has a cow. Well, you can sell milk every day. I guess you could sell goat's milk too, but goats don't make milk as quickly. So the person who has the cow will get returned faster than the others and they'll go out and buy another cow. And now the cows, uh, they can't survive on the grass in the commons, so they start nibbling on the wheat and the strawberries. And the, 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 the gentleman with the cattle uh, goes, oh, this is great, I'm selling milk, everything is good, and I don't have to pay for the fodder. Uh, they go and get themselves a third cow, and now we have too many cows for the field, and we wind up nibbling the field down until all the topsoil's gone and it blows away or, run, or it runs off in the rain and we wind up with something that's not good for growing anything. So this was Harden's metaphor for the environment. But inside a corporation, the environment is represented by the code base. So this is a card game that we use to um, enlighten PMO participants. Often they have seen uh, they have been a part of for years and years and years, and they don't realize that it's themselves that are screwing up the way things work. It's themselves. It's kind of like monsters from the id, but well, it's more monsters from the game theory. But you, you'll see what I mean, or monsters from the Nash equilibrium. So here we have a PMO with four managers, and each manager has a starter release with 20 poker chips. Um, and those, those poker chips, uh, that represents their, their P&L, their budgets. Uh, each of them has an individual one. Uh, they don't share them. And uh, they each chip in one poker chip that's going to represent a bonus. The bonus uh, that will be given to whichever manager uh, delivers the most business value at the end of a, a release. So we're assuming kind of a, a big company dynamic, but this also applies when we're doing continuous delivery. Uh, it just looks slightly different. For now, I'm gonna do the, the easiest to visualize version of this. We have 10 product features on the table. Each of these features is represented by one red card and one black card. And the idea is that the red card represents the cost to deliver the new feature and the black card represents the business value of the new feature. Now, uh, there is an extra cost, which we'll come to in a minute, which to do with technical debt. But let's, let's give an example of delivering a feature. The top left-hand player, oops, there we go, picks the, the feature that has the, the best business case, the, the best uh, return and uh, return, to, to return on investment. So the king is worth 13 in this game, aces are only worth one. So that one returns a 13, only costs an eight. Now you might go, wait a second, why don't they pay off the technical debt immediately? Well, paying off the technical debt means they would have to spend an extra 50%. And this simplification, this is ridiculously simplified, but the dynamics are, uh, seem to be uh, correct. I have yet to find anyone involved in any PMO anywhere who will turn around and go, oh, no, our PMO doesn't work like that. So the technical debt could be paid off, but this manager wants that four chip bonus, which this is not going to go into their P&L, this is going to go into their pocket. This is their, their Christmas bonus. It's, a, it's worth a Ferrari or a house payment or whatever it is, depends on, uh, maybe it's, it's just lunch next Tuesday if you're working for some firms. Nevertheless, it's the bonus. They paid eight, that's why their, their P&L's gone down to 11. Um, 
and they earned 13. So they're, they're sitting pretty, that looks pretty good. It's not possible to deliver more value than that, even though the ROI, maybe you could do better. So, um, but they didn't pay an extra 50%, an extra four chips to pay off the technical debt because they're not required to. They can cut corners, they can do it quick and dirty. In other words, they can increase technical debt. Now it's the next player's turn and the next players and the next players, they all deliver uh, a feature. Now, I, one thing I didn't mention about technical debt, well, as in the real world, you have to pay interest on the technical debt. So every player will have to pay 10% interest on the technical debt at the end of the turn. But there's no incentive for paying it down. This is a, a game that's played, as Stefan said, over some period of time. By the time the technical debt mounds up to represent a legacy, some of these managers will be long gone. So why would they worry about it? We often, uh, in Agile, talk about software craftsmanship, where the idea is that the problem with technical debt is our developers are being lazy. They are not refactoring. They are not paying it down. But what we're seeing in this game is that our developers are being rushed. And they say, well, look, we, we, just, we want to make certain the tests to right, do the CICDD. We don't get the BDD right. And the manager or the product owner says, yeah, you can do that later. Uh, let's, let's get them. Let's, let's really hit this next release hard. We, we, we want to, you know, the kind of rah-rah. So the players uh, continue playing. They are allowed to analyze new features. Uh, basically, it costs them one poker chip to um, get an, uh, another pair of cards, one black and one red, dealt out. And the, 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 the red deck and the black deck are shuffled so that it's a, a fair game. And here we are at the end of a release, and you can see that, um, well, they've all got a, a little bit of money left in the PL, but not enough to give them an advantage. So they would rather take people out for Christmas drinks with that last bit of budget. And you can see, easily see who the winner is, the gentleman in the top right who's got two jacks and a five. That's 27 business value. That's the person who's going to get the bonus. Now we're in a situation where this portfolio has a gross profit of four chips if you counted up all of the cards we had on the table. But since everybody had to pay 10% of the technical debt, uh, which is 60, that means before they get into the next release, and, and some businesses really are like this, they have shared environments and no one is able to get anything done until the, the environments are, are stabilized halfway through the next release, which is basically paying down technical debt. This is giving us a negative net profit and the technical debt's going to compound into the next release. So even though there was a gross profit, when we take the technical debt into account, uh, no, we have a loss, but it's invisible. Does that reflect your experience of PMO so far, Stefan? Oh, absolutely. It's a nice uh, shadow budget no one is taking care of because, say, if you're, if you're using churning out features, if you try to create a feature factory just to pimp your CV to head on to the next career step program mm -hmm. in a different organization, who cares about technical debt you leave behind, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that your successors have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I have seen this game played at all levels of all organizations, C-suites, boards, EPMOs, PMOs, uh, even program management can play this game if they're silly enough. But there is a simple way to remedy this tragedy another little glimpse of the Lorax. This is from the recent, more recent movie. I watch the animated Lorax, both the 60s and the, the recent one, at your peril. They're both bad for sanity. The, the, the Dr. Zeus book is fantastic, but uh, particularly the songs from the 1960s Lorax show are just, they're possibly the worst thing Hanna Barbera ever did to anyone, ever. So here we have the same deal. We have the same cards being dealt out, but we're changing the rules of the game. We have a single p &L, and uh, uh, we, we're changing the incentive structure so that um, if the portfolio earns net profit, then everybody will get a one chip bonus. And if it doesn't, then no one will. Does that make sense so far, Stefan? Oh, absolutely. So this, this is kind of assuming that we're willing to share more information than we usually do. And actually we can 
we can leverage the information we would have to share to do this. And I think called open book management, which we're going to look at in just a minute. Um, but let's just play with these simple rules and see what happens. So the first thing that happens, the top left corner says, well, all of these features are actually going to be bad for getting our portfolio to turn a profit. Uh, so let's take them all off. The, the ROI is such that after paying down technical debt, they would all be losers. And uh, we don't want technical debt because we want to maximize the net profit. If we've got incentives such, set up in such a way that we can look at how much our cost of quality is affecting our top line and hinge our reward structure to that, well, then we're able to make rational decisions. Going to, what was the name of the gentleman you quoted before, Stefan? That was Charlie Munger. That's the, um, the co-entrepreneur of Warren Buffett. So that's been oh, interesting. Because I think he's ripping off um, uh, Ellie Goldratt because Ellie Goldratt said, tell me uh, how you measure me and I will tell you how I behave. If you measure me illogically, I'll behave illogically. Very yeah, similar. That's, that's just a different variation of that. You know? mm -hmm. Anyway, so the first thing this gentleman has, or lady has done is uh, I've taken all of the loser features off the board. And now, because they've got an incentive to, what they want to do is make certain that the portfolio gets the most throughput, not their value stream, not, not the people they are managing. They're not competing with the other managers. They are trying to maximize throughput for the whole portfolio, possibly for the whole organization, depending on how we want to set it up. There are three features that are worth delivering. They set about delivering those. The next player also analyzes. It doesn't matter that there were a bunch taken off there. They will try and um, innovate and uh, design as rapidly as possible. They're not, what they're trying to design is improvements to the business ecosystem for the organization as a whole. Because if we can find those, it will increase our business report. And that's what their bonus is based on. Or this is going to be based on the, the overall whether there is a profit or not. Uh, but we'll get fancier in a little bit. So they're not so lucky that all of those three features uh, are losers. They don't even try to deliver them because it would reduce the net profit. Then we've got uh, another one and uh, they find two that are worth delivering and another one and they find that there's two that are worth delivering. And this continues. In fact, they do all of this in parallel. They don't need to be taking turns, but they didn't need to be taking turns before. For that matter, we're uh, amassing the technical debt here so that we can see it. But if we're really going to pay it down continuously, and there are non-linear benefits to doing that, if we are going to do that, then we will do it continuously. We'll do it as we go. So uh, now we have got to a stage. Yes, there we are. I knew there was something in the deck that said that we, we, we want to continuously pay down the technical debt. Now we've got to a stage where there is um, enough PL to, um, I think it's about 29 points of technical debt. Uh, there's about 96 points that have been delivered. So we have enough, uh, in terms of gross profit, we have enough PL here to pay off that technical debt and then some. And that means at the end of the turn, we have a PL. Uh, we actually, in gross terms, 96, but we, we need to, to create a, the, the bonus pool for the next bonus. So that's why we, it's, it's 92 left in the PL. So we have a net profit of 12. And that means everybody gets their bonuses. Everybody happy and no technical debt, and no, which is to say it's not mounding up, they're not building legacy. So in a traditional PMO, people talk about legacy as if it was somebody else's fault. And no, it's our fault. And if we're going to stop generating legacies and stop robbing ourselves of a potential ROI, we have to change the rules of the game. What a nice way to end this webinar. Ah, there's one more thing. I wanted to talk about uh, a, a, a variation on this that comes from John Case and Jack Stack uh, called Open Book Management. And there's plenty of stuff on this online, but in a nutshell, we open the books. That's not to say that we're going to share stuff that is commercially sensitive or salaries. We don't want to be silly about the way we open the books, but we need to understand the throughput analytics for our portfolio or for our organization as a whole. 
We want to teach all of our staff, including the operational folk, including production support, all of them, uh, the generally acknowledged accounting principles and throughput accounting mechanics. Uh, we want to link everyone's bonus to top line throughput improvements. Now, different people may have negotiated different bonuses, but we can look at linking the percentage of bonus that will issue for each of them to the top line throughput improvement that we're targeting. And then we can also include share options. This is, this is sort of the John Case view of open book management. Jack Stack, and there's a story that goes with this, which we don't have time for right now. He sort of gamified this um, and called it the great game of business. And what his idea was that we will project what the bonus pool would be for the entire year. And we'll split that bonus pool into 10 pieces. Um, every quarter, we'll start in the first quarter with one of those 10 pieces and different performance levels. And the performance levels are all about the critical numbers, which in the terms we've been talking today, it means the, the bottlenecks in terms of throughput and in terms of the market bottlenecks. So every quarter, we will increase the number of pieces. The first quarter has one piece. The second quarter has two pieces of the bonus pool plus whatever was not earned in the first quarter if there's like four target levels for these critical numbers then this gives us a way to have a game where by the time we get to christmas we have a bonus pool it's four of these pieces plus anything that was not earned in the first three quarters so what we're really trying to do with this is pull down the bonus everybody's trying to pull down the bonus as quickly as possible by increasing throughput as quickly as possible um, and we can use five wires and define mini games to each of these critical numbers has components and we can get people to figure out what their component is, how what that contributes to that. And so in addition to the great game, we could have mini games. The rewards can be uh, taking people out to lunch. The rewards can be different kinds of social uh, benefits. So uh, the, the mini games can be used in any organization and they still have a very profound effect. But the great game, well, let's have a look at um, the performance of a corporation that used the great game for 25 years, which is Jack Stack's corporation. And there are very few organizations that can boast an increase in share price from 10 cents to $234 in 25 years. And a beautiful steady one like that too. There's only one year where it has a tiny little dip after 87. So the question of does this open book management stuff work? Does the improvement to the game dynamics work? My word, it does. And there's plenty of case studies for how this works in some very large corporations that have become fully employee owned this way. I, I think I'm out of wind, Stefan. Do we have any questions? Um, I hope so. So uh, please um, use the Q&A tool because otherwise it's getting a bit messy answering your questions. Maybe we don't. Well, we have been rabbiting on for a while. Uh, and that's okay. Yeah. Then let's call it. Uh, I think we can. Now, I, but I should say next time, next time we are going to look at the game without thrones, which is a way to improve the communication channels, uh, to get learning to flow across hierarchy, to be able to fight the game theoretic problems we just looked at. It uses Spotify style chapters, but also a system of representative councils and treaties, and I mean representatives of chapters, not of squads, um, and a kind of a thing we, we call leadership as a service, which is a consensus decision-making method. And we derive a lot of these patterns from uh, something called the great law of peace, or at least that's what the Europeans call it. It derives from uh, an astonishing civilization that existed, well, it's still around today, but it was a political power in North America for 500 years called, uh, well, they called themselves the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Europeans called them the Iroquois. And we will have a look at that as well next time. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. Pete, thanks a lot for your time. And uh, we talk in two weeks time on the 20th. Beautiful. Awesome. Um, I'll send you some blood for it, Stefan. 
Perfect. Very good one. You too. Bye.